Thank you very much, Professor Ocampo. This was both stimulating and wide-ranging, as it should uh, on this occasion. And um, it is now time to move on to the uh, questions and answers section. And what I'm proposing is that we take three questions at a time and then give uh, Professor Ocampo the possibility of commenting uh, on these three questions. I should say that we would appreciate if you would say clearly your name and also relevant institutional uh, contact or affiliation. Um, and let me also add that uh, this event is webcasted, so there uh, may also be questions uh, from those who are sitting uh, around the globe. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, Professor Ocampo. Uh, my name is Noel Gonzalez from uh, the Mexican uh, delegation uh, here at the, at the UN dealing with the second committee. Uh, first of all, let me, let me tell you that uh, your interventions are usually very, uh, uh, very provocative and very useful in the endeavors that we, that we undertake and in the discussions that we usually held uh, or hold in the, in the, in the frame of the, of the UN. We are, in a sense, looking for a place for the UN in the international discussion on these uh, matters and having such a, a, an insightful uh, presentation is always is always very very useful. Um, having said that, and having uh, stated how much uh, my delegation and myself we appreciate uh, your intervention and your very clever uh, your very clever uh, opinions on, on these issues, I would like to raise a, a couple of questions which are a little bit more provoking, just to have your uh, your reactions and your thoughts on a couple of issues. Uh, first of all. Uh, on, 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 on the concept of elite multilateralism, of course I am Mexican. I, uh, my, my country has the opportunity to participate in, in, in the G20. And uh, as such, we do not see, uh, the, we do not completely share the, the view that was just stated by, by, by you. We do believe that the G20 and other efforts are of course important, of course, uh, uh, ways to, to approach and to respond to uh, the current challenges and we believe that in a sense they are aimed at being efficient and effective and provide a quick response that perhaps you know, without them wouldn't have been uh, possible, perhaps uh, wouldn't have we had the G20, would have we waited until the multilateral um, system would be as uh, perfect as you were just pointing out. Perhaps the, 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 we would have gotten uh, really deeper into the, the crisis and we would be uh, absolutely um, in, 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 in a very worse uh, situation than we are, than we are today. Uh, so, from our perspective, the mandates of the multilateral institutions and of these kind of institu institutions are complementary, and they shouldn't be competing. Uh, on the other, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, conditionalities and debt, um, my question would be very simple: uh, Don't you think that if we uh, would promote uh, a completely conditionality-free or a debt forgiveness mechanism, just as such, uh, we would be compensating for? not very responsible uh, economic behavior? Wouldn't be, we be promoting perhaps even more uh, instability by just uh, giving away uh, things? And uh, a third question which is more related to a discussion that we are having in the frame of the, of the, of the, of the United Nations uh, now in the second committee, which has to do with the creation of a panel of experts on international economical affairs. Uh, there has been a lot of arguing uh, about how this uh, eventual panel would be, for instance, duplicative or the, dealing with divisive, divisive ideas and not really uh, proning for consensus. Uh, there has been comments in the sense that good ideas naturally uh, arise uh, to the surface and are taken over uh, within the existing mechanisms. What would be your response to that kind of comments? Thank you.
Edinella from the United Nations Population Fund. Uh, thank you very much for the enlightening uh, lecture. I have just one quick question. Um, I'm wondering whether you could elaborate on the effect of your proposals for development and particularly for the implications uh, on its implications for the development aid system as we know it today in terms of both multilateral and bilateral aid. Thank you. Uh, Bob Larrick, I work with the NGO community on an interfaith, holistic good government, interfaith, business, security, and development alliance, and mental health community. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I agree with what you've been saying, and, and the issues of uh, biases, not only against Keynesian, and working on these issues myself and promoting most of them. Uh, don't we need a UN that's capable of dealing with the biases in general? not just the Keynesian ones, and whatever makes us dysfunctional, and the importance of the UN uh, and, uh, and evolving the human condition uh, and the ideas of all God's children, one human family, the meaning of the words in our lives, not just in Korea, Korea Kashmir, and Jerusalem, and the women's issues, but uh, reconciling the one human family and what we need to do to have a, a more rational uh, UN and global systems generally going to a mental health function this evening <laughs> on rational mode of behavior therapy. But uh, the idea of win-win collaborative approaches rather than the overly nationalistic and overly competitive orientations generally, which uh, don't we need to transform to a more uh, common good uh, orientation. Okay, thank you. Jose Antonio, you want to? <clears throat> well, let me uh, start in the reverse order to say that, uh, you know, I agree that uh, 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 any um, major reform effort uh, has to include the, the United Nations uh, at the center. Uh, I, I said the United Nations system uh, because I want to underscore that point that, that uh, it has to be also the IMF and the World Bank as part of the United Nations system. So yes, you have to think of, a, of how to a, build collaborative uh, a, frameworks um, a, of different sort. A, on the development aid system, uh, it was not part of my, a, my a presentation, uh, simply because I think it's a different topic. Uh, a very important by itself, you know, a, but it's not part of the, the discussion going on. In, in fact, uh, a, the uh, the way I address, I, I even deleted the, in my presentation the whole uh, area, which is the financial regulation, uh, simply because that's an area where most action uh, has taken place. So, uh, and that's why I concentrated on other, other issues. Uh, now, uh, the one implication of my proposals is that the um, uh, not the aid system as such, but the uh, multilateral development banks could benefit from this reform. Uh, through this thing that I call the development link in the international monetary system, that is to uh, to a mechanism that would allow the IMF to uh, to invest in uh, in uh, development uh, bank bonds uh, of different characters. So, I, but that's one uh, uh, implication. Of course, uh, for a whole uh, a, a full architecture, you need you need uh, to think of the you know that uh, obvious and very important element. Uh, of the financial uh, system in the broader sense of the term. Now, the, um, uh, on the, um, uh, let me refer to the, 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 the first two points uh, of, the, of the delegate from Mexico to say that I, I, I don't mean uh, uh, by any means to imply that the G20 has not played a very useful function. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I think it has, so I have no question that it has been effective. But I just uh, don't feel the, it, it is the sort of institution that the world uh, deals on a stable basis. Uh, and, and I'll just mention uh, uh, two, and I, I'm going to uh, you know, mention a few countries of which I probably should not in a, in a, in a UN meeting, but, uh, but since um, I am an independent researcher, <laughs> being invited to speak, uh, I, I feel free to do that. But one of the very, uh, uh, very peculiar implications is that the G20 has at the same time reinforced the IMF and destroy a mechanism of IMF governance. And why do I mean that? You know, 
the IMF is based on a constituency system. So it's a grouping, it's a group of countries that have seats on the table, not individual countries. I mean, there are five members uh, that have a right to be on the table. Uh, now part of the reform is that everyone is going to be elected. Now, that means that if a constituency is going to have a specific position, it has to be agreed by the constituency, not by the individual countries. That's the characteristic of that system. Now, it just happens, and I, that's the, the time I'm going to mention countries. For instance, the constituency headed by Canada has all the Caribbean countries, the English Caribbean countries. Now, has Canada uh, talked with the constituency to agree on the positions that it's going to take in the IMF through the decisions of the G20? So it's a strong, uh, and the same. Let's say my country's part, as I said, mentioned, or the Brazilian, or the constituency headed by Brazil. As far as I know, my country has had no voice in the positions of Brazil, which I find sensible, by the way. I, so I, I'm not complaining that the Brazilian position, uh, Brazilian position are not sensible. But my country, which is part of the Brazilian constituency, should have a voice in that constituency, which has not had. So the G20, at the same time, has reinforced the IMF and has destroyed the governance structures of the IMF. That's my view. And that's why the, it's, a, it's, an, it's not a consistent mechanism in the long term. And that's why I think it has to be brought into another arrangement. I actually think that you know, it has to be a dual arrangement. For the IMF, it has to be actually one reform that I was in my slides but I did not mention, which is a proposal uh, of the, uh, this commission headed by Trevor Manuel, the former finance minister of South Africa, uh, which is uh, to give, a, a, to create a, a powerful uh, mi ministerial meeting of the IMF. So many of the decisions taken by the G20 should actually be taken by the ministerial meeting of the IMF. Okay? And there should be a leaders forum, which is my proposal to bring to the United Nations system again, okay? So that you have a sort of G20, but you know, of a formal character within the United Nations system family, okay? So that's why I think that is more coherent with the structure. So I, I'm not, I actually have no, no problems with Gs of any character, so long as the Gs are part of the multilateral system in the formal sense. So I, I, I think the G77 plays a very useful role in the United Nations, the G24 uh, in the IMF and the World Bank, and, and you can think of the European, which always work as a grouping, uh, work very well with him. But it's, that's a different, so that's a, that's a way the GIS should operate within the, the multilateral system, not outside the multilateral system. That's, that's why my concept of a little multilateralism does carry, as its name implies, some negative uh, views. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Moderator, and uh, let me begin by congratulating uh, Professor Ocampo, someone who, whom I knew as Under Secretary General Ocampo <laughs> in course of my participation at the uh, Global Forum on Reinventing Governance. Uh, for, for specially, I think, uh, speaking the truth to the power, quoting Will Dabowski here. I think you have done a wonderful job by, in terms of highlighting the issues that we are required to know. And uh, Professor Ocampo, you have rightly uh, put before us the dilemma whether we should continue to do the right things or we should get the things right. And I think your conclusion is, is very much in favor of getting things right and we are very supportive. And uh, as, as a representative from Bangladesh, and I have not introduced myself, uh, my name is Najibur Rahman. I, I represent Bangladesh Mission at the ECOSOC. So I am a delegate to the ECOSOC. And in this very room, many a times we have, we have criticized G20 for lacking legitimacy. So I think you have rightly done this job because the G20 has not so far uh, included voice and representation from the LDC countries. Having said this, uh, Professor Ocampo, I just want to connect you to one of the larger debates that we had in this building last week in the form of the parliamentary hearing 
uh, in the context of economic recovery. And the parliamentarians from around the world has largely expressed their disappointment uh, with the way IMF has been functioning by referring to the failure of a lot of structural adjustments program. Unfortunately, you have not referred to any, uh, any of that uh, things, especially how does IMF devise its structural programs and when the program fails, the country suffers, but the, uh, none of the IMF staff was taken to task on this. So maybe your whole thesis of getting the discussion back to the IMF by, by sort of merging the G20 in a, in a more democratic IMF structure, I think we'll have to go a long way uh, in terms of reforming the governing structure, something you have already hinted. So maybe some more commentary in that line would be welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would like to express uh, my deep appreciation for the intervention and presentation of Professor Ocampo. Uh, I am from the uh, Venezuelan mission. I am second committee expert and have been coordinating for G77 uh, its position for for international financial system and financing matters. Well, um, first of all, just simply to state that, that uh, we feel uh, in the same way that we should place SDRs in the center and uh, particularly the group uh, associates the, the highest relevance to uh, liquidity issuing mechanisms without um, conditionalities uh, and, and particularly uh, we see that the SDR has a fundamental role associated with the global reserve system. The matter would be how to implement which are the steps forward to to promote this role. We we know that uh, there are voices in the G20 that has underlined the need for having an open discussion without prejudice to this matter and we hope that this could happen in the working group of the United Nations General Assembly to follow up the uh, Financial Crisis Conference. We would like to listen, which would be your recommendations, how to focus that discussion in a way could be the most productive and action-oriented in the ways UN uh, produces responses, which is resolutions. Um, particularly, you mentioned the need of working on the sub-regional mechanisms. Well, that's a position G77 has state also as, as a complementary manner for issuing liquidity and maybe it would be interesting to know uh, which is your, your particular uh, feeling of if, if there is a real possibility of the, and developing uh, um, liquidity issuing mechanisms on, on, on the regional like uh, financial systems complementary let's say to the to the central system then the last would be just simply uh, fully agree to your your comment to the need of a leaders forum. There has been some, some conversations and formals regarding the possibility of, of uh, having a, a highest uh, level um, political meeting at, at ECOSOC and it might bring to the UN the kind of discussions we have seen in, in G20 and with the benefit that obviously the ECOSOC or, or other UN process, it's a process based on the election of the members so uh, all members she can attend and, and there is a fair, a fair a way to, to be part of it if the rest of the membership believes so. Uh, also uh, we believe that that is complemented by the um, contributions of the working group. I will stop myself here uh, just simply to underline that is under discussion a resolution of the panel of experts and G77 support an independent uh, a, a technique uh, assessment. So um, it will be important if, if you if you express if you believe that it's possible independent expert working on a daily basis uh, back to back with member states. Thank you. I'm with the University of Copenhagen. Um, you've spoken a lot about what the IMF should do more of. Um, could you also elaborate a little bit on what it should do less of, either as part of the evolution of the institution, natural evolution of the institution, or in line with the earlier speaker, uh, these institutional arrangements that, that you spoke of? Thanks. Well, let me uh, first refer to the, um, to the IMF. I, I know some of my... Um, uh, so some people are uh, uh, are uh, skeptical about the IMF, including some of my best friends. So it's not uh, so, uh, and uh, and they don't sometimes agree with my proposals, uh, which is actually to work, you know, by in a sense by uh, 
making the IMF do the job for which it was created. Uh, you can read the, the first article of agreement. Actually, I had it in my, my back. I, I brought it, uh, 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 but I, I just don't have it with me at this moment. But it's quite interesting. Just read the first article of, of the articles of agreement of the IMF, and then you know, I, I think the institution that was created has broader functions. For instance, it actually starts with monetary cooperation. You know, it has A, B, C, D. The A is monetary cooperation among countries. I think that uh, has always been taken up out of the IMF by the major countries. So you had to, that my point is, let's meet that article of agreement. Let's start by doing that, okay? By doing what it says in letter A of the first article of agreement of the IMF. Okay, um, so it, so the problem is whether the uh, you know you can create an institution that has more credibility and and, and yes it, the IMF has to rebuild a, a lot of credibility, uh, but in my view it has taken some effort some steps to do that. I mean the reform of the quotas that I presented uh, are a step forward. It's uh, it's actually a major reform. It's more than it was expected a few years ago. In the reforms of last year in the credit lines, it actually eliminated the link between lending and, con and structural conditionality. So you see the IMF could still require uh, structural conditionality, although it has been streamlined significantly. I mean, uh, uh, but, uh, but you cannot tie uh, disbursement of IMF loans to a structural conditionality. That was part of the agreements of last year, which I think was a major step forward. And, and, the, and this issue that I called uh, uh, the uh, eliminating the stigma uh, is also something, I mean, you, you read in, uh, 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 very regularly in the speeches of the IMF managing director today. Because at the end, that's what you need. I mean, uh, if the world is going to have an I mean, for instance, let's, let's go back to, to the problem of excessive uh, accumulation of international reserves. That's one problem that the system has now. Now, one way to correct that problem is actually to make credible the fact that you know, when you are in an emergency, you will have access to the IMF without overburdening conditionality. Uh, so, and, and that's what I, I think it has to be part of the reform effort. I think we have gone some way, but not entirely the, you know, the, the way we have to go. That was my proposal, that there should be some unconditional uh, credit, you know, overdraft facilities, if you want, uh, in the IMF. Uh, so, you know, you can think of many ways, but I think the, uh, and of course, uh, you have to make the institution more plural in its views, which is a, a criticism that many of, the, of us have had of the IMF in the past. But those are things that I think are possible now and actually, in my view, are already happening. You know, you, you read semi, uh, some of the analysis by IMF, there is a significant change in the way, in the, way um, the IMF perceives. So that's my, my, my answer to the two uh, reference to uh, the IMF. Let me just mention that in my proposal, ECOSOC is something different from my proposal of a UN system organization at the leader's level. For one basic reason, because ECOSOC performs other functions that you cannot transfer uh, to that body. Um, as you cannot transfer, in my view, and, the, and I think this is some of the problems I have with the, with the G20, you should not transfer the decisions should be taken in the IMF board to a leader's forum. Uh, of a limited character, because then you are replacing the institutional mechanism that you want to strengthen. And, and that's why, uh, in a sense, uh, ECOSOC will be more the internal uh, UN, uh, head of the UN Economic and Social and Environmental Area, uh, but uh, uh, it will have a leaders uh, uh, committee of some sort at the UN system level that will, in a sense, be mandating ECOSOC as well as it will be mandating the, the, uh, the board of the IMF or mandating the board of the World Bank or mandating the WTO, et cetera. So you have to, you have, to have, that's, that's, so I, I see the ECOSOC as something which as well as the IMF board or the World Bank board will be subordinate to that uh, new uh, system organization. So that's why I, my proposal is different from the old ideas of transforming ECOSOC into an economic security council. I think that proposal, uh, in my view, doesn't make sense. Uh. Okay, thank you. Um, Francis, you are our link to the participants in the webcast. 
I understand there was at least one question. Yes, that's right. Um, we have from Clark Matthews in the USA. We have uh, could Professor Ocampo speak to the problem of financial derivatives, which exponentially leverage the problems of hot money capital flows? Should the IMF ban or tax derivatives or capital flows? So from uh, you knew wider in Helsinki. Um, in the first part of your very interesting lecture, Ozi Antonio, uh, one of the themes was the role of gold, uh, which I believe Keynes referred to as the barbarous relic. Um, a few uh, weeks ago or a month ago, uh, Bob Zolik of the World Bank uh, suggested a completely different model for the global financial system with an enhanced role for gold. And I would be very interested in uh, getting your comments on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to Professor Ocampo. I'm Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence, and thank you to Professor Ocampo for this very, uh, shall I say, reasonable uh, proposals. And uh, still, I see a few um, points which may require more attention. A large part of the uh, exchange rate uh, volatility derives not from trade, but derives from uh, capital movements. And uh, the capital movements, uh, the proposal you made uh, concerning the, the way they regulate, they seem to be quite mild. And I think that even if one looks at the uh, measures introduced recently in Brazil or in Chile during the 1990s, I think they had limited effects. And so there is a, a problem of regulating uh, the problem upstream, which is what the prior speaker mentioned. Now, the U.S. is intervening in the regulation of the domestic, I mean, the U.S. financial market. Now, the U.K., for instance, and I've just spent three months there, is very reluctant uh, to do that. And uh, so I, my fear is that we will remain with the problem which upstream is the one which determines uh, large movement of speculative capitals, because the IMF itself has recognized it, with very large costs. And so I think that uh, that should be a part of the proposal. Now, the second observation concerns the, your proposal about uh, uh, how to manage globally exchange rates. Well, first of all, one has to act on the capital account. Otherwise, we won't be able to maintain target zones. And the other thing is that currencies, when they are not upset by capital inflows of, uh, or other, other sh similar shocks, uh, basically, they tend to fluctuate in areas. So there are countries which fluctuate with the yen, countries which fluctuate with the yuan, countries which fluctuate more or less along. They are semi-pegged, you know. So perhaps uh, one idea could be to uh, um, uh, regulate, the, uh, establish a target zones for among the major currencies. So uh, six or seven points. And the last observation, I think that uh, your proposal to bring together more than before the UN, W World Bank, IMF, WTO, ILO, ILO perhaps. I mean, these institutions, they have very different uh, constituencies, even with the current improvements. And I think we, we, there is still a risk of falling into a situation in which the UN constituency says one thing, the IMF, which has the money, says another thing, and uh, the WTO, which has another governance system and another one. So the bringing these institutions together, which would be very important from the point of view of the total global governance, requires a sort of an alignment, a better alignment of the governance among, across this different institution. Thank you for, the very, for your very nice presentation. Let me start by, by, um, by answering the question of gold of uh, here, uh, my, of Tony Addison. Uh, by saying that uh, I, as many others, was utterly surprised uh, that the president of the World Bank would come with a proposal to revive the role of gold uh, in the international monetary system, uh, simply because I, I think it has been a long-term process of demonetization of gold. Uh, and I think the decision of 1971 by the United States, by the, you know, the President Nixon, uh, was, the, in a sense, the last step in, uh, in a process that uh, will lead uh, finally to, to the uh, loss of gold, uh, or the monetary role of gold. I mean, the, uh, as many people commented after that uh, very uh, strange proposal by the president of the World Bank, uh, the, uh, you know, the gold, uh, I mean, the gold standard died, and died for good reasons, because it was not good system uh, at the end. 
uh, and one of the basic problems of the gold standard is that the supply of gold is not flexible enough in the short term. I mean, you need for good monetary management, you, you have to be able to increase money and re reduce money when you, that's what the central bank do all the time. So you have to expand the supply of money and sometimes restrict the supply of money. That's something that the, the, uh, the gold standard by itself uh, lacks or lacked in the past. And that's, why it, uh, and, and that's why with the demonetization of gold, gold is essentially the quanti-essential speculative commodity. And because you cannot produce it uh, in uh, substantial amounts relative to the supply. So it's really uh, absurd to propose to give back a role to gold again in the international monetary system. Um, now, uh, uh, I, I'll answer the, the, the question of derivatives actually as part of the uh, uh, questions raised by Andrea uh, Cornia uh, by saying that, uh, that uh, in a sense, my proposals go exactly in, in that direction. And my proposal is that, of course, volatility uh, in, uh, for instance, the dollar-euro exchange rate is basically determined by capital flows. As the volatility of you know, emerging country currencies today are determined by capital flows. Uh, and that's why uh, one of the five building blocks of my proposals has to be a system of regulation of the capital accounts. Uh, except that I, I think that uh, we have to go beyond the current uh, system in which you essentially anybody can do whatever they want, but financial markets pressure them to liberalize. That's what the system is now. Into a system in which you have some sort of common agreement on what is acceptable behavior. And that markets understand is acceptable behavior in regulating capital flows. Uh, that was my, my essential point. And I, I think that will be important for the issue of exchange rate volatility because, uh, uh, I mean, the Europeans, my proposal is to do something like the Europeans did, uh, of you know, having some target zones, you know, some managed fluctuation of major currencies. Uh, that's exactly what the, uh, my proposal is uh, in, 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 uh, in the exchange rate system. Now, the role of derivatives, uh, 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 I mean, I didn't mention, and, and I guess I, you know, in preparing to this lecture, I started by think, you know, thinking a lot about talking about financial regulation, but I decided only to focus on two elements of the financial regulation that are relevant for, uh, for uh, my topics of the monetary reform, or the other topics, let's say, of monetary reform, which is the, the issue of capital account regulations and the issue uh, of uh, debt workouts. Uh, so that, you know, those are the two issues in which I focus my attention in the five elements uh, of my proposal. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, you can think, uh, first of all, I totally agree that, um, uh, that the derivatives have to be regulated. I think the, uh, the the direction of the recent reforms had, has been good. Uh, they run the risk of not being sufficient, but uh, I, I am one of those who thinks that the uh, derivative market has to be open, transparent, it has to be done uh, uh, not over the counter, but in, uh, in explicit markets. That has to be subject to specific regulations, including uh, some uh, uh, capital uh, associated to the uh, derivative operations. Uh, so as to avoid uh, a pure uh, derivatives, you know, operations based exclusively on credit, uh, which is, you know, extremely volatile behavior. Uh, and I guess the, the most important implication is that as part of the, for my uh, framework, is that as part uh, of what uh, uh, you think of the global monetary reform of global, uh, which one of the elements is capital account regulations, we have to think of what to do with exchange rate derivatives, which is essentially part of that story. And in my view, exchange rate derivatives should be subject to a tougher regulation that, than other derivatives, and that you probably want to, to eliminate certain forms of, uh, of uh, uh, entirely prohibit certain uh, exchange rate derivatives. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, non-deliverables, uh, which is one form of uh, uh, of uh, derivatives that I, I find particularly uncomfortable uh, in, uh, in foreign exchange markets. Thank you for your presentation, Professor um, Ocampo. Um, Oscar Amigon, historian of City College of New York. My question is, uh, when you talk about the um, international bankruptcy, um, I have just one question. is, What role will the international bankruptcy system play 
in today's econo economy uh, when it comes to uh, specific countries facing uh, economic meltdown. Could, could, could you please uh, repeat the end of the question and maybe speak a little bit louder into the sure. mic? I'm sorry. Uh, what role will the economic um, bankruptcy system play when it comes to uh, specific countries facing economic meltdown uh, in today's economy? I'm Roberto Frankel from <coughs> University of Buenos Aires. I thank you very much, Jose Antonio, for the sensible presentation and sensible proposals. I have one question. As far as understood, you are uh, the reserve accumulation, you are, are, your hypothesis about reserve accumulation are strongly based on the idea that countries demand reserves because of precautionary motive. This, as you know, has been debated and suppose that this is the not the main motive, but countries demand reserve because of a mercantilist motive, because they intervene in the exchange market in order to preserve real exchange rate, depreciated or competitive real exchange rate. It, if it is the case, the the uh, the. Uh, Available of, of a new lines of liquidity will not uh, will not um, uh, will not take countries not to accumulate reserves, and if it is the if it is the situation, uh, the, the, the 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 part of the proposal of your proposal related to exchange rate has a much more important role. In, in the set of proposals. I thank you very much for your um, interesting and informative presentation. My name is um, Mojuba Oluokome, and I teach political science at Brooklyn College. And I'm just wondering to what extent developing countries would gain increased voice in the proposal that you make about uh, reforming the architecture. I'm African and I'm particularly concerned about Africa. To what extent are the issues that concern um, Africa and other, other developing areas going to be taken seriously in reforming the um, architecture since they don't really have that much power in the system as it is? Yeah, on the first question, um, uh, let me say that, of course, uh, once a bankruptcy court is approved uh, as an international treaty, uh, it will be binding for any country that wants to come to the, uh, to the court. Uh, 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 I'm afraid that process will take some time, so uh, that's for that simple reason, uh, countries under current difficulties uh, will not uh, be able to, in my view, benefit from that arrangement. Uh, and maybe some other ad hoc arrangements will have to be put in place, uh, except that the history is that you know every time you have a crisis, you invent new ad hoc arrangements, uh, uh, which is not the best way to develop um, a, a stable international system. I mean, after the Latin American debt crisis, we have the Brady and Baker plans. Uh, then we have, for uh, low-income countries, we have the uh, HIPIC initiative, and we have the multilateral debt relief initiative. Uh, and then you can think of you know many, many other things. I mean, you have, uh, and then you have unilateral, uh, you know, um, uh, restructuring processes. So my, my proposal is it less, you know, uh, develop a, a multilateral, like with uh, common framework, uh, and then use it, of course, uh, for a, every single member uh, of that arrangement. Now, on the the question here on the on on the uh, by Professor Frankel, uh, I I uh, well. It, it I am fortunately on the side that mercantilist uh, policies are not the dominant uh, policies in reserve accumulation. Actually, because if they were, uh, they, if they were, uh, uh, they would be violating uh, the principle that you cannot manipulate your exchange rate uh, for trade purposes. And so I, I actually think that that's not the dominant. Um, and I think there is a, a, a good literature that uh, I, uh, agrees with me. And one very important re uh, factor um, uh, that you see is that 
the largest amount of foreign interventions in foreign exchange markets uh, take place actually when there is an excess inflow of capital. I mean, that's what you see empirically. Uh, and that's why I think the precautionary motive is really the, the, the important one. Uh, and, uh, and that's why you have to think of a system that at the same time, uh, you, know, uh, you know, following my previous answer, solves the problem of, the, you know, of, uh, of capital account regulations and the exchange rate system. Uh, so as to avoid, you know, excessive fluctuations. So you have to tie the two things together. Uh, I mean, now I, I use, I think, the, in in my writings, I increasingly uh, see precautionary motives, in a much broader sense than than other people, because in in many cases it's, a, it's almost as as a preventing crisis. A, in a in a very immediate way. So you have to have, and, and from that purpose, from that point of view, many developing countries have now more reserves that they need uh, in a in a very uh, clear way. But the the problem is a different one because every time you have a capital inflow, a new capital inflow, uh, you may be forced to intervene, even if you have excess reserves. Why? Because also for crisis prevention purposes, you want to avoid a appreciation of your exchange rate, the generation of your current account deficit that you will lead, that will lead to crisis. So the, the, the peculiar irrationality of the current system is that you are forced to accumulate more reserve than you will ever need, basically because the system, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, in a sense, tends to reinforce excessive capital flows. Uh, so you are uh, uh, forced to have excessive reserves to manage that problem. Uh, so that, that's why the preventive focus may actually lead uh, to excessive flows, so, uh, and, excuse me, excessive capital inflows, which in turn may uh, lead to more flows because you say, well, this is safe investor, you know, uh, you know nobody will ever think that China with the level of reserves will, you know, face a balance of payment crisis. So, so you say, oh, we'll bring money to China because it's risk-free in a sense uh, from that, from balance of payment crisis. So that you actually could actually enhance capital flows because of the uh, self-insurance uh, motive uh, behind the research accumulation. Now, on the issue of voice of developing countries, uh, I, I think what was done is a step forward. It's insufficient, uh, uh, certainly, uh, in my view, and, uh, and the issue of low-income countries has to be taken in, uh, in, uh, into particular consideration. Uh, uh, the uh, basic point is that uh, the only way to manage that problem is with more basic votes, uh, uh, because any quota system, uh, uh, as uh, the recent reform efforts, uh, indicate uh, will actually tend to reduce the quota of, the, of low income countries. Uh, so I, I think the system has to have a, a even larger component of basic votes uh, that was approved um, a, a couple of years ago when the, uh, there was the decision to actually to triple the amount of basic votes in the IMF. So the basic votes actually make it make the IMF a, a, a system a voting system a mix between the one country one vote to a, pro, a small proportion and one dollar one vote, which is the dominant. So my point is, let's make the one country one vote larger, and that's I think the, the way to increase the voice of low income and a small countries. Alfonso Diaz, uh, no institutional affiliation, just a countryman of <laughs> Dr. Ocampo. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Ocampo, of all the, the proposals that you uh, put forward, uh, would you say that the hardest uh, nuts uh, will be the coordination of microeconomic policies? Uh, I mean, uh, and it, it goes beyond the, the traditional Keynesian versus uh, uh, monetarist uh, uh, divisions or distinctions, but actually has to do also with uh, nationalism, uh, different cultures. I mean, Germany uh, still, uh, after uh, more than 80 years, seems to have uh, uh, lingering memories of the Weimar Republic uh, uh, um, uh, hecatombe. And, um, um, uh, converse, uh, also, the other, uh, the second uh, 
uh, policy that is, is nearly impossible, in my view, to, to, to be accomplished is on the exchange rate. I mean, do, do you th believe that the U.S. will uh, willingly uh, give up um, the dollar as the, as the universal uh, reserve? I'm from Tulane University, <laughs> and I have two questions. First one is, there's been other proposals uh, floating around, some in, in D.C. and other parts of uh, the world. How does yours, in very broad terms, specifically differ from others? Is what are the points of contention from what's going on? For example, by the Center for Global Development, the Institute for the Peterson Institute, and others who've been putting uh, forward their own proposals. And the second question is, in order to get to the point that uh, you're proposing, which, by the way, I thought, uh, like my other colleagues, was uh, an excellent presentation with a lot of reasonable uh, proposals. It seems that the issue of uh, an arrangement between the U.S. and China will have to be solved uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to have the, uh, the uh, ban that you're proposing for the current accounts and uh, also the type of uh, exchange rate policy that you're proposing and coordination may not be acceptable. Uh, and I wonder what, what's, you know, what, what do you think about uh, how that will be solved and can it be solved? Let me um, start by saying that none of my comments was meant to imply that the U.S. doesn't have financial problems. I mean, that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, not belonging to the, to the reality, right? So what I said is that uh, in a strict terms, the, the U.S. doesn't have a financing problem during a major financial crisis. Uh, in, in, in terms of financing is balance of payments. Um, like, so that the, the, the U.S. in the foreseeable future, uh, and I hope uh, ever, uh, will have the problems, let's say, that uh, that a, a typical developing country has during a crisis, which is simply has no access to markets, and uh, and, uh, and is then forced to to, to do a, a very severe adjustments. Uh, you know, that's one family of problems of, in the financial area. Uh, you know, developing countries usually have many, many, many more problems than the U.S. I mean, actually, uh, when there is this phenomenon called flight to quality. Uh, that takes place during a you know, severe crisis, it's actually that people are bringing money to the United States. Uh, so it's actually the U.S. benefits. Um, one uh, basic reflection is the fact that, you know, when you have one phenomenon like that, what happens is that uh, the U.S. is able to borrow cheap, more cheaply, while countries in crisis have to borrow more costly. That's a basic difference, uh, you know, and, and one of the basic uh, advantages uh, of being at the center of the system. Um, now, uh, will, will the U.S. ever give that, uh, give up that? I actually think uh, there are reasons. I mean, to start with, the, um, uh, it is very interesting that like, historically the United States has been at the center of pro proposals of special drawing rights. Mm -hmm. So the proposal that effectively was adopted in the 1960s was the more the U.S. proposal than the European proposal. And last year, issuance of a special drawing rights was a special proposal of the U.S. So it came from the U.S. So I, I, I don't think. And one basic reason uh, why uh, I, I actually skipped one slide that I had of why it might, the SDRs are good for the United States. Um, and, uh, and I basically agree with, uh, with one chapter of uh, Professor Stiglitz's book, Making Globalization Work, the one on, on global monetary reform, in which he actually makes that, you know, the, the, the basic point that the United States has the, the problem that it has to run deficits in order to give, international, give uh, the rest of the world liquidity. But the deficit, particularly if it's a current account deficit, is reduction in the aggregate demand for the U.S. So actually the U.S. will benefit now from not being at the center of the system. Uh, uh, by you know through that mechanism, so that uh, and that's why I actually think that the United States uh, is not you know of course is not going to lose in any reform that you can think of its role as the you know major international financial center, but but I think the U.S. may be willing to give up or to share or to reduce the importance of the dollar in the international system. It actually may benefit from doing that. 
that's my the, that's why I think this is viable. And now, uh, and now on the um, uh, on the dollar renminbi um, uh, issue, uh, I it's a it's a very long issue. I on the renminbi. Uh, but on the dollar, let me say that I, I agree with the position of the United States that the United States monetary policy does not have exchange rate objectives. So they, I, I, and I think that's correct. It may have uh, exchange rate effects, but it doesn't have exchange rate objectives. And, uh, uh, and, and secondly, uh, 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 I do agree, however, with the Chinese position that uh, it would not make sense to make a huge you know, massive appreciation of the renminbi. I think they are afraid of running into the Japanese problem of the, of the late 1980s. And I think they are right. They should avoid that. It will be bad for the world if China goes into a financial crisis. Uh, so I, I think that. But also, uh, I do think that the, uh, the renminbi is overvalued. Uh, it's undervalued. Uh, so that the, the uh, has to move into, uh, it, you know, probably faster than it is moving now. But one way in which China can do it and is doing it and is not recognized in international debate is actually through nominal wages, uh, nominal wage policies. I mean, you can think of increased nominal wages in China, which is a major part of what is going on in China, as a major contribution to the correction uh, of global imbalances. Both because it increases costs in China, so it's an effective real appreciation of the renminbi, and because it increases domestic demand uh, of a surplus country, which is also a contribution to the reduction of global imbalances. So I think the, the, the wage policy of China should be given more central recognition in, uh, in the efforts to rebalance the global economy. On Nora's question about how the difference is a long, it will take a, a bit uh, long time. I, I think my, my major difference, uh, I guess, I think the reserve system has uh, similar proposals, including the Chinese one, by the way, of last year. But um, uh, and, uh, uh, and probably on the credit lines, there's probably not major disagreement. Uh, I think the major disagreement will probably be on, the, on, the, uh, on some global regulation of capital flows and on the exchange rate system. Uh, I, I do think, uh, actually, that the U.S. will, at the end, uh, move into supporting some form of exchange rate targets of, you know, of a certain character, uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, but on capital controls, it's quite clear that the U.S. doesn't want to move in that direction. It's just you have to you know, uh, uh, look at it, at, at what the G20 said in the last meeting, uh, to understand uh, that the, the Koreans wanted that to be in the agenda, and that uh, some others, and particularly the U.S., did not. Uh, and, and so it's, you have to uh, read it between the lines, that it actually says in, in the G20 communique that you can actually use capital controls. <laughs> I think it is time to uh, conclude. I would like, like to say thank you very much to Professor Ocampo for giving uh, such a stimulating presentation. I would also like to say thank you to all participants for engaging and asking uh, both relevant and pertinent questions. Uh, it's quite obvious that the global governance system does need reform, and it is certainly a topic that we will be continuing to discuss, debate, and trying to come up with the right answers. I think it was nice to take one further step in that direction uh, today. And Professor Kampel, let me just assure you that at UNU Wider we will continue uh, to work according to the principles that you outlined in the beginning. It is our intention to continue as an independent flat platform where we can bring people from the north and the south, from the east and the west uh, together to try to have an open dialogue where we develop relevant policy relevant uh, research where there is a focus on the poorest in the poorest countries. May I say that this was the 14th wider annual lecture as we move forward with our work program. I think that it is appropriate that I mention just by way of concluding uh, that the 15th wider annual lecture will actually take place in Mozambique and it will actually be a Chinese uh, who will give that lecture. This is Dr. Justin Lin, who is the Chief Economist of the World Bank, Senior Vice President as well. But that would take place in Mozambique, in one of the poorest countries in the world. That is where our focus should be, both in the academic world and in our policy actions. Thank you all for being here today, and look forward to seeing you in Maputo next year.